Greetings and welcome to the GEHA Retirement Webcast. First of all, we'd like to thank you for being a GEHA member and thank you for your public service. I'm Laura Noyes, GEHA's Outreach Representative for Washington State. And joining me is Brian Sperling, our resident Medicare and retirement expert. Brian will be joining us at the end of my presentation to answer some of the most common questions pertaining to federal retirement and Medicare. We also have several outreach representatives on hand to answer chat questions throughout the webcast. Feel free to submit your questions at any time during the presentation in the Q&A box to the right. If we are unable to answer your questions during the webcast, we will respond through your registered email afterwards. You're probably here today because you're in the planning stages of retirement. Either you're getting ready to retire in a few short months or just starting to think about retirement down the road. As you can see by our agenda, there's a lot to talk about when it comes to retirement and Medicare, including whether or not to enroll in Medicare Part B, which is the most common question we get out in the field. Now let's get started. One of the first places you'll want to start for federal retirement planning is the retirement section of OPM's website, opm.gov forward slash retire. Postal employees should visit lightblue.usps.gov where you'll find retirement planning information specific to postal employees. Under the retirement drop-down menu on the OPM website, click on the retirement system that applies to you. Here you'll find one of the most helpful resources for your planning, the pre-retirement timeline. On the next page, Click on the Planning and Applying link towards the left. This will reveal the timeline, which is broken down into tabs from five years or less to within months of retirement. Each of these tabs contain a checklist of actions you should be taking at that stage of your pre-retirement planning. Another great resource is the Frequently Asked Questions link, also available under the Retirement tab on the OPM homepage. The FAQ pages have answers to hundreds of questions, they're broken down into three categories, pre-retirement, post-retirement, and leaving the government. Many of the questions pertain to health benefits in retirement, and that will be our focus today. One of the most important benefits you've earned as a federal employee is the ability to take your health plan with you after you retire without having to increase your portion of the total premium. In retirement, the government continues to pay over 70% of you and your survivor annuitants monthly premium. Your share of the total premium will be deducted every month from your annuity. If your annuity is not large enough to cover your share of the premiums, you may change to a lower cost option or choose to pay your premiums directly to your retirement system. Your retirement system will notify you of your options and take whatever actions you request. All right, let's go over some retirement ground rules with the Federal Employees Health Benefits Program, known as FEHB. In order to qualify for coverage after retirement, you must be continuously rolled in any FEHB plan for five years prior to retirement, commonly known as the five-year rule. The rule does not require you to be enrolled in the same carrier during those five years. The five years can include time you are covered as a family member under another person's FEHB enrollment. It can also include time covered under TRICARE or CHAMPUS as long as you were covered under an FEHB plan at the time of your retirement. The Federal Employee Dental and Vision Insurance Program, or FEDVIP, does not have the same five-year requirement. You can enroll in a FEDVIP dental or vision plan for the first time as a retiree, even if you were never enrolled as an employee, as long as you have an immediate annuity. If you cancel your FEHB coverage after you retire, you will not be permitted to re-enroll at a later date. If you join a Medicare Advantage plan or TRICARE in place of your FEHB coverage, you do, however, have the option after you retire to suspend your FEHB coverage. When you suspend your coverage, you may re-enroll during the FEHB annual enrollment period unless you involuntarily lose your Medicare Advantage plan or move out of the plan's service area. After you retire, you may find that your health plan doesn't suit your specific needs any longer or your family status may have changed. As a federal retiree, you have the same ability as an active employee to make changes to your health coverage. Instead of using your agency's online portal to change your health plan, 
you will use OPM's online services website for administering retirement benefits. OPM also offers a dedicated website during open season to make health plan changes for the upcoming year. Because retirees pay FEHB premium post-tax, you can re reduce your enrollment from self and family to self plus one or from self plus one to self only. You can also cancel your FEHB coverage at any time. Remember that if you cancel your coverage, you cannot re-enroll unless you canceled because you are covered under another FEHB enrollment during the period of time between your cancellation and re-enrollment. You will be eligible to re-enroll when you lose coverage under the, that family's member's enrollment. You also have the ability to change plans outside of open season for some qualifying life events. One event that people are surprised to find out is not a qualifying life event is retirement. Retirement does not allow for plan changes outside of open season. Another thing some people are not usually clear on is whether family coverage is required in retirement. In fact, you are allowed to add a spouse or qualified dependents in retirement, which takes us to survivorship benefits, another great benefit of federal retirement. Survivorship benefits allow for your survivor annuitant to continue FEHB coverage after your death. There are some important rules to follow here as well. You must be enrolled in a self plus one or family plan at the time of your death, and at least one family member must be entitled to an annuity as a survivor. If you do not provide for a monthly benefit after your death, your survivor will not be able to continue coverage under the FEHB program. To make certain your survivor annuity information is accurate, You'll want to schedule an appointment with your personal representative who can review your official personal folder, or OPF, with you. It's a good idea to review your OPF five years prior to and one year prior to retirement to make sure all your records are complete and accurate. You should verify all your service and make sure your insurance coverage is documented. You can also review your election opportunities to provide benefits after your death to your spouse, ex-spouse, or another person you designate as having an insurable interest in your continuing life. Now that we've discussed a few of the more important FEHB regulations in retirement, let's talk about the parts of Medicare and how they work with the FEHB program. Well, Medicare began with two parts, Medicare Part A and B, now known as the original Medicare. You become eligible for Medicare when you turn 65 or when you have certain disabilities. Part A is premium free for most people, and Part B requires a monthly premium. In the Medicare section of all FEHB plan brochures, you'll find the primary payer chart. This detailed chart outlines when Medicare is primary or secondary according to your employment status and other factors determined by Medicare. When you retire from federal service, Medicare will become your primary health coverage, and your federal plan will become your secondary coverage. A little later in the presentation, we will discuss why you should consider delaying enrollment in Part B when you are still actively employed. You will not be penalized for late enrollment. Medicare Part A is commonly known as hospital insurance and is premium free. Part A covers inpatient hospital care, skilled nursing facility care, home health care, and hospice care. Almost all federal retirees receive Part A without having to pay a monthly premium. Part A hospital insurance has deductibles and daily copays that are based on a 60-day benefit period. In 2018, the Part A hospital deductible is $1,340 for the first 60 days and then $335 per day for days 61 through 90. If you're in the hospital longer than 90 days in a benefit period, your 60-day lifetime reserve would be activated. The copay for each lifetime reserve day is $670 per day. Part A can have significant out-of-pocket costs. Your FAHB plan will help substantially reduce these out-of-pocket costs. Almost all FEHB plans pay Part A deductibles and copays on your behalf when Medicare is primary. Many people refer to Part B as the doctor portion of Medicare, but it's more comprehensive than just coverage for doctor visits. In 2018, after the annual deductible of $183, Part B covers services at 80%. Along with doctor visits, Part B covers outpatient hospital care, including emergency room visits, outpatient diagnostic tests, such as x-rays and laboratory tests, 
durable medical equipment and supplies, physical and occupational therapy, ambulance transportation, and other outpatient services. Before 2007, Medicare B beneficiaries all paid the same standard monthly premium. After 2007, new enrollees paid higher monthly premiums based on income levels. In 2018, most new enrollees making $85,000 or less paid the standard monthly premium of $134, which represents a quarter of the total monthly cost of your Part B premium. In 2019, close to 91% of beneficiaries will pay the standard monthly premium. Those in higher income brackets will pay a greater percentage of the total Part B premium. Because premiums for Part B have steadily risen over the years, and since premiums are now based on income levels, the decision on whether to enroll in Part B may take a little more thought and calculation for some federal retirees. Later in the presentation, we'll go over the factors you should consider when making your decision. But for now, let's go over how and when to enroll in Part B. Many federal retirees want to know why they should pay for Part B premiums every month when FHB plan covers these same services. FEHB carriers cannot require you to enroll in Medicare Part B. However, many retirees like the convenience, peace of mind, and potential savings for taking Part B. Almost all fee-for-service plans within the FEHB program will pay the 20% that Medicare doesn't. This means you will usually have 100% medical coverage. Those same plans will waive their deductibles and coinsurance for most medical services. They typically allow you to see any provider that accepts Medicare assignment anywhere across the country without referrals, even those providers outside the plan's network. Pre-certification is usually not required for hospitalization and other expensive tests when Medicare A and B is primary. Some plans even pay for medical services when outside the U.S., something Medicare doesn't cover. Almost all FEHB plans, including GEHA, will coordinate with Medicare electronically so you won't have to file paper claims after going to the doctor or hospital. Fee-for-service plans with low premiums, like GEHA's standard option health plan, may also reduce your expenses, as they usually cover most medical expenses at 100% when Medicare A and B are primary. If you decide not to enroll in Part B when you have FEHB coverage, you will continue to pay your plan's medical deductible, co-pays, co-insurance amounts up to the plan's yearly catastrophic limits. If acute care is needed in any given year, it may translate into several thousand dollars out of your pocket. You should compare these out-of-pocket costs to the amount you'll pay for Part B premiums for you and your spouse per year. You should also consider you and your spouse's health status in the years preceding age 65. An interesting NIH study sheds some light on when our health care dollars are spent during our life cycle. On average, we spend more than half of our health care dollars between ages 65 and 84 years old. If we live beyond 85 years old, we'll spend two-thirds of our health care dollars after the age of 85. This means the oldest group, 85 plus, on average, consumes three times as much health care per person as those aged 65 to 74 and twice as much as those aged 75 to 84. Only you know what risk level you are comfortable with. Some people are more focused on whether their out-of-pocket medical costs will exceed their premiums, while others value peace of mind and the convenience of easy coordination between Medicare and your FEHB plan with low to no out-of-pocket costs for medical treatment. Signing up for Medicare is easy. The Social Security Administration is responsible for the Medicare enrollment process and the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, or CMS, is responsible for the administration of Medicare once you're signed up. If you already receive benefits from Social Security or the Railroad Retirement Board, you are automatically entitled to Medicare A and B starting the first day of the month you turn age 65. You will not need to do anything to enroll. Your Medicare card will be mailed to you about three months before your 65th birthday. If you're not receiving Social Security benefits, you'll have to sign up for Medicare Parts A and B. Your window of eligibility is seven months. It begins three months before your 65th birthday, your birthday month, and three months after your 65th birthday. If you miss the initial enrollment period, and you haven't applied, you'll have to wait until the general enrollment period from January 1st to March 31st to sign up. Coverage would then be effective on July 1st, and you may have to pay a penalty. 
Even if you don't plan on retiring before you turn 65, you should still apply for Medicare Part A. Remember, there is no premium for Medicare Part A, and you're entitled to it regardless of retirement status. Having Medicare A as a secondary payer will reduce your out-of-pocket costs should you be hospitalized, and it will help you keep more of that hard-earned money for retirement. The easiest way to sign up is online. Just go to ssa.gov forward slash Medicare to begin the process. It can take less than 10 minutes to complete, depending on your situation. Social Security will process your application and contact you if they need more information. Otherwise, you'll receive your Medicare card in the mail. If you decide not to sign up for Medicare B when you first are eligible, you may be charged a late enrollment penalty. The penalty is 10% of the premium for the first year you do not enroll and is permanent. For every 12 months you are not enrolled in Part B, the premium penalty increases in 10% increments. There's one big exception to this rule. When you turn 65 and you are still enrolled as an active employee under FEHB or are covered under your spouse's group plan and he or she is an active employee, the late enrollment penalty does not apply to you. In this case, it may not make financial sense to enroll in Medicare Part B just yet because your health plan is still considered the primary payer and Medicare the secondary payer. Once you or your spouse stop working or are no longer covered by the group plan, you will have an opportunity to enroll without a penalty during a special enrollment period. This eight-month time frame begins the month after you retire. You also have the option to enroll at any time when you're covered by the group health plan. Medigap plans, also known as Medicare supplement plans, cover the out-of-pocket costs associated with Medicare A and B. These plans must be purchased for an additional monthly premium and do not include prescription drug coverage. As you approach 65, you will likely be inundated by direct mail and sales calls from insurance companies selling Medigap or Medicare supplement plans. They may tell you to cancel your FEHB coverage and go with their cheaper plan. This is a red flag. They may not have your best interest in mind. Remember, if you cancel your FEHB coverage, you will not be able to re-enroll, not even at open season. One of the richest benefits you have as a federal retiree is that the government continues to pay over 70% of your monthly FEHB premium after you retire. Federal retirees do not need these supplemental plans because FEHB and Medicare will coordinate benefits to provide comprehensive coverage, in most cases near 100% coverage on most major medical services. FEHB plans also provide prescription drug coverage. Medicare Part C or Medicare Advantage plans are private health insurance plans approved by Medicare. To be eligible for a Medicare Advantage plan, you must also be enrolled in Medicare Parts A and B. When you enroll in Medicare Part C Advantage plan, you will forego traditional Medicare A and B coverage for a plan that usually covers much of the out-of-pocket costs associated with A and B. If you enroll in a Medicare Advantage plan, usually FEHB plans will not waive their plan deductibles or coinsurance when Medicare Advantage plan is primary. There are a wide range of regional HMO and PPO Medicare Advantage plans available. Their premiums and out-of-pocket costs vary widely throughout the country and may be more limited in certain areas. Some plans require preauthorization for some care or referrals to see specialists, and many limit your choice of providers within the network. Some plans only pay for emergencies outside their service area. Medicare D is the latest addition to the Medicare program, is for prescription drug coverage, and has a separate monthly premium. OPM has determined that federal retirees who are enrolled in an FEHB plan do not need to enroll in a Medicare Part D plan. OPM recommends reviewing plans before Medicare becomes primary. Becoming eligible for Medicare is considered a qualifying event which entitles you to change to an, any available FEHB plan and plan option beginning on the 30th day before you become eligible for Medicare. Because Medicare A and B will be primary, a lower cost FEHB plan, like our standard option plan, may be adequate for your needs now. If your needs change over time, you have the ability to change plans every year during the FEHB open season. We'll end today's presentation by summing up some of the more common scenarios federal and postal retirees are faced with when Medicare becomes primary. 
The most popular option for federal retirees is having Medicare A and B along with an FEHB fee-for-service plan, like GEHA. In this option, you'll pay the Part B premium plus the FEHB premium. If you enroll in a Medicare Advantage plan or Part C along with your FEHB plan, you will be paying your Part B premium, your FEHB premium, and most likely a premium for the private insurance company providing your Part C coverage. The other option is not taking Part B and only paying your FEHB premium. This will depend on what level of risk you are willing to tolerate in retirement. If you are a military retiree, you are eligible for TRICARE for Life when you enroll in Medicare A and B. You only pay the Part B premium. No other premium is required. TRICARE for Life also includes prescription coverage. And lastly, Medigap or supplement plans require you to pay a Part B premium, a plan premium, and a Part D prescription drug premium. Federal retirees do not need to enroll in one of these plans. Do not cancel your FEHB coverage if you enroll in a Medigap plan. We'll close today's webcast with a brief description on GHA's standard and high option health plans, how they work with Medicare A and B. When you have Medicare A and B as your primary insurance, GEHA waives deductibles and copays on both our standard and high option plans. We also pay 100% of covered doctor and hospital expenses after Medicare's payment. The GEHA Express program electronically coordinates claims with Medicare for no hassle claim processing. And you can visit any provider in or out of our network as long as the provider accepts Medicare assignment. You'll also have peace of mind knowing your coverage goes wherever you go, even overseas. While the standard option and high option provide similar coverage, there are a few differences. One difference is a monthly premium. The other is how prescription drugs are covered. Retirees with Medicare A and B on the high option plan have a higher monthly premium, but pay less for brand name medications. Vision benefits are also included with all GHA plans for no additional premium. Information about GEHA's connection vision including $5 eye exams and discounts on eyewear, can be found at GEHA.com. For more detailed information on how GEHA coordinates with Medicare, visit GEHA.com slash Medicare. On the right side of the webpage, you'll find several retirement-related videos. You'll also find two popular downloadable guides, Countdown to Your Federal Retirement and the Medicare plus GEHA guide, which is also available in the resource list to the right. Well, that ends my portion of the webcast. Please let me introduce you to Brian Sperling, a resident, retirement, and Medicare expert. Brian will be available to answer some of the questions we have received today. Thank you, Laura. I'll go ahead and share some questions that we've received through the chat today. So we've got some great questions coming in through the chat. Um, so I'll go ahead and take an few minutes to go through some of these and so we can help um, understand some of the questions that everybody's having today. So I'll start out with, I've got a great question here, will my premiums increase when I retire? So that is an outstanding question. Um, now your federal health benefit plan premiums will remain the same. That's one of the great benefits of being taking your federal health plan coverage into retirement is that your FEHB premiums will just simply be paid monthly versus biweekly. However, if you are a postal craft postal service worker, then you will see a difference in your premiums change because the you will no longer receive your um, postal subsidy toward the additional premium. But for most all other federal uh, retirees, your, your FEHB premiums will remain the same. You'll just pay on a monthly basis versus a biweekly basis. Now, I've also got some questions coming in on the chat here, and I have one here asking us to talk a little bit about the dental when you retire. Um, now, the dental coverage you can take into your retirement with you, but the interesting part about dental is you can also add it after you've retired, even if you didn't have it before. There is no five-year requirement on enrolling in the dental plan program. Um, now, I've got some additional questions here, and well, I'm going to just go ahead and work through these through the chat. Um, I've already retired and want to know more information about how Medicare works with GEHA. When we were kind of talking about that earlier in the presentation, there's a lot of dynamics to understanding how Medicare works with GEHA. 
The big thing is when you're retired and Medicare becomes primary, and if you have our higher standard option plan, we'll waive your co-pays and deductibles, and you'll have no out-of-pocket costs on most of your medical services, and you will only pay your prescription co-pays at that point. It really becomes what I like to say our super plan coverage. You really get outstanding level of coverage when you have your Medicare as your primary, Part A with Part B, and your GEHA higher standard plan. Now, as a follow-up question to that, a lot of people have been inquiring if um, I should remain in the high option plan. And that's a great question also. The aspect in staying in the high option really becomes, there's not a lot of incentive anymore at that point to stay in the high option. It becomes much more beneficial for you to consider going down to a, the standard option since both plans will waive copays and deductibles and you'll net at 100% coverage. So you really end up with um, having a much lower premium level if you were once in the high option. You can now go to the standard option and really only see a minor changes in your coverage level. Actually, the only change you'll really see is a reduction in your name brand prescription drug coverage. Otherwise, since the both plans waive copays and deductibles with Medicare and give you the 100% benefit level on most of your medical services, you're really not losing out on, on very little to anything by switching from the high option. And then that switch to the, from the high to the standard also saves you a significant amount of premium, which will help offset paying for your Medicare Part B costs in the future. Um, so these are all some great questions. Um, I've also got another question here. Um, can I change my FEHB enrollment at retirement? Um, now, retirement is, we covered in the presentation, retirement in itself is not um, a qualifying life event. So, for example, if you retired at, let's say, um, uh, 67, that does not, and you retired in May of 60, and you May of the year in it wasn't open season, you would have to wait to your federal health plan, tell the FEHB open season to make your FEHB changes. You cannot, just because you retire is not a qualifying life event. Now, to follow up with that, I've got another question here about um, is FEHB plan primary or Medicare primary? And that's really a two-tiered question. Um, so FEHB is primary when you are still working for in federal service. That means your federal health benefit plan will pay first and Medicare will pay second. Now, at that point, we often recommend that people will delay taking their Medicare Part B since Medicare is in the secondary role at that point. And we found that Medicare in the secondary role doesn't always um, pay as much as some of the federal health benefit coverage at that level. So generally, it's recommended at this point if you're still working, you will have your FEHB coverage as your primary and Medicare as your secondary. Now, that will switch around when you retire. And the key here being when you retire from federal service, then your Medicare coverage and your Part A and your Part B will then become the primary payer, and your federal health benefit plan will become the secondary payer. And as I was mentioning earlier, again, as with uh, your GHA plan, we will waive your copays and deductibles on the high and standard option to hence scoop up that remaining 20% on the Part B coverage or your $1,300 deductible on your Medicare Part A. So it really work, coordinates very well together. But again, the key thing to remember here is Medicare is primary when you are retired and your FEHB health plan is primary when you're working. And then it switches around when you're retired and Medicare becomes the primary. Now, I've got some additional questions in here that I'm going to go ahead and pull out. Um, are we automatically enrolled in both Part A and Part B? Okay, great enrollment question on Medicare. So with Medicare, you're only automatically enrolled if, for example, you were already drawing Social Security when you came up on Medicare at age 65. So, for example, if you came up on Medicare um, – and you had retired at 63 and drew your Social Security early. Then, when you came up on Medicare at age 65, Medicare would automatically enroll you in both Medicare Part A and Part B. They would send you the card automatically. Now, if you had not, if you had not interacted with Social Security and had, had drawn your Social Security, you would not be auto-enrolled. 
but you're auto-enrolled if you're drawing your Social Security already. So that's really the key thing to remember there is if you aren't drawing your Social Security, you won't be auto-enrolled. If you are drawing your Social Security, you will be auto-enrolled. Now, if you are auto-enrolled in both Part A and Part B and did not want Part B at that time, you would have to send the card back and just select that you would not want Part B. So again, excellent question here. Now, I've got another question that's come in about um, international coverage. Could you talk more about coverage if we were overseas? Okay, that's a great question. A lot of people want to know um, how does FEHB coverage work overseas? How does your GHA coverage work overseas? How does Medicare work overseas? Well, interesting enough, Medicare does not pay foreign providers. So if you're retired and you're overseas, Medicare will not pay any on any claims that you have if you were outside of the country. There is a couple of exceptions with um, in transit to Canada, but aside from that, if you were internationally in South America or Europe, um, Medicare would not pay foreign providers. So that's one thing to remember. But the great thing is, is with your federal health plan coverage, and for example, like the GHA standard and high, both will cover you internationally, even though Medicare will not cover those claims internationally, and will continue to waive the copays and deductibles, so you will still have 100% coverage internationally, even though Medicare does not pay their portion on the claims. It's a fantastic benefit if you plan on traveling a lot in your retirement. Um, I've also got another question here about um, utilizing the plan, uh, health plan network after I'm retired. If I want to move around from state to state, okay, it's a great question. A lot of people are snowbirds. I'm from Arizona. We've got a lot of snowbirds out there. People come from Minnesota and Illinois and all over the country out to our out to our warm weather state in the winter months. So what's great is um, if you have the the high or the standard option plan, we no longer require our members to utilize the plan network. Um, now it's always great to use in network providers, but since Medicare becomes the primary payer when you're retired, and this, is, and this key thing to remember what I'm talking about in this particular scenario is you are retired, Medicare is your primary, GHA is your secondary payer. At that point, we no longer require you that you have to use in-network providers to receive that 100% benefit level since Medicare is the primary payer, and therefore you can travel the country um, freely, and, and as long as you see a provider that bills Medicare, um, then you are allowed to get your 100% benefit level, your copays and deductibles waived at those, at those providers. So it's really a fantastic program if you're going to be traveling either internationally or moving from state to state within the country. Um, so we have some great, uh, really great programs designed to work very well for retirees. Now I'm going to share in some additional questions here. Um, if we have Medicare A and B, do we need extra dental insurance? Okay, very good question. Um, so Medicare does not include dental coverage in any capacity under traditional Medicare A and B. So at that point, as we were talking earlier, you may want to add FedVIP dental coverage as part of your retirement costs and considering that plan. And GHA has some really great uh, FedVIP dental programs, both our high and our standard plan. And what's great is if you didn't have dental coverage prior to your retirement, you can still add it after your retirement. It's not like the FEHB rule with the medical plans where you have to have a plan in place five years before you retire and have to have a plan in place on the date of retirement. With the FedVIP dental program, you can add it after the fact. Um, even after you're retired, a federal retiree can add additional dental coverage in there. And remember, Medicare traditional parts A and B does not cover dental services. So that's a great, um, a great question there. Now I'm going to keep moving down here through some of the chats. Um, uh, I've got another question here. When I'm re I'm retiring before I'm 65. Okay, great question. When, how do I sign up for Medicare? All right. So if someone's retiring before 65, um, you won't sign up for prior to 65. You won't sign up for Medicare until you turn 65. That's the key thing to remember there. And then you can sign up several ways with Medicare. You can go down to the Social Security office and sign up in person. They now allow enrollment online. 
or you can even sign up over the phone. So they've really tried to make the sign-up process for Medicare very easy. But keep in mind, if you retire before 65, you won't sign up for Medicare until you turn 65. That's the key thing to remember there. Um, now, I've got a question here. Not understanding the difference between Part A and Part B. Okay, what is the difference between Medicare Part A and Part B? Part A is inpatient services at a hospital. That's the key thing to remember here. Where Part B is physician services and outpatient services. These are the key things to remember between the two main parts of Medicare. Part A is always for facility services inpatient at a hospital, and it doesn't include services for doctors when you're inpatient. But Part B is for outpatient services and physician services, whether they're rendered in or outpatient. That's one of the key differences between the two programs. Now, I'm going to check again our check, chat cues here and see what else we've got coming in. And there's quite a few questions coming in here. Um, when can I sign up for Part B, and how does this affect my GHA coverage? All right, we've been kind of getting a lot of a similar type of questions coming in through here. So that's, again, uh, signing up for Part B. Now, we mentioned Part B sign up is optional, right? You don't have to take Part B, but it's very beneficial to take Part B. So signing up for Part B, if you're still working, you'll probably want to defer enrolling in federal service. Defer enrolling in Part B, why is that? Because your federal health plan's primary. Um, and But when you retire, that's when you're going to want to sign up for Medicare Part B. And if you're over 65, you're going to want to sign up. And you let's say you retire, in our example, again, at age 67, you're going to want to consider signing up for Part B in the special enrollment period, which is eight months at beginning the first day of the month after you retire. So, exa for example, if you retired on, let's say, June 15th, starting July 1, you've got an eight-month window to sign up for Medicare Part B at that point. If you miss that eight-month window, you could potentially be exposed to a Medicare Part B penalty added on to your cost, which you want to avoid. So that's the key thing, is if you're still working, um, you can actually sign up for Medicare Part A and Part B while you're still working without any penalty. Uh, but when you do retire, uh, you do have that special enrollment period, and you've got to get down there in that eight-month period. If you miss that eight-month special enrollment period and you've already come past your initial enrollment period, that's the key thing to remember is you don't want to have that penalty if you, if you miss your special enrollment period. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and keep moving through some additional questions here. We've got some great questions coming in on the chat, and thank you, everybody, for submitting questions. Um, can you enroll in Part B later without penalty if you're not working for the federal government? All right, so this is kind of um, – the answer – the short answer on that is, is no, unless you have another employer's group health plan. And that's the key thing to remember there. So I'll give you an example, and this is a very common scenario. Um, you retire from federal service at, let's say, um, age 62, and you get a job working for a private contractor. Um, and you end up um, even going back to work for the federal government, but as a contractor, right? And you're no longer working as a direct federal retiree anymore. Then what would happen is as you came up on Medicare at age 65, a lot of people think, well, I'm working full time. I don't need to sign up for Medicare Part B at this time. But the key thing is you have to have your current employer's group health plan. That's the big thing to remember. If you don't have your current employer, and your current employer in this case would be a contractor, not the federal government, you wouldn't be exempted from that Medicare penalty. So what that means, you would have to sign up for Part B if when you turn 65, otherwise you would incur a penalty. All right, let's keep on moving down the, the line here, and I'll, take, I'll answer questions for about another 10 minutes or so uh, as people keep submitting questions on the chat here. And um, Medicare Part B premium is based on income, but what income is that? Oh, very good question, excellent question. Is it pre-retirement income or retirement? or retirement income benefit. All right, so I think I understand what they're asking there. 
So with Medicare, how they determine the Medicare premiums is based on um, your modified adjusted gross income, okay, off your tax return. Now they're looking at, they base it on a year system. So if you're retiring in 2018 and signing up for Medicare that year, they're going to be looking at your 2016 income tax returns. They look at two years back, okay? So they would, and then they would apply it to that Social Security rate chart that they have out there. So basically, most people, most of us will fall into that first bracket, which is if you're filing individually and they're looking at your, your tax return from 2016, if you filed individually and had a an, an, an modified adjusted gross income of 85000 or less, or jointly file the return and have a joint return of 170000 or less, then you're going to be paying that $134. But it's based on income from your tax return from two years prior from the year you're enrolling. Now, a lot of people ask, well, why do they do that? Well, they're doing that because we haven't filed our income taxes for this year yet, right? And sometimes they aren't, you haven't even filed for last year yet, depending on what time of the year it is. So that your, your ta income really isn't finalized until two, about two years after the fact. So they're looking at that income level from that. So keep that in mind when you're determining um, how much your Part B is going to cost you because sometimes your working income might be higher than your retirement income. So that's a factor that you'll want to consider um, in preparing to pay for your Medicare Part B costs. So again, great questions here. So give me a second here. I'm going to bounce back over to the chat. Oh, and, and I've got a follow-up question here about the, um, will it be adjusted on your income if you, um, as your income changes over the years? And the answer is yes. So they are analyzing your income every year to determine your Medicare Part B premium. But the also, the caveat to that, it doesn't just go down. If your income goes down, your Part B premium might potentially be reduced if you go to a lower bracket. But if you also pull out, let's say, some TSP money, and that goes counts toward your adjusted gross income, that could potentially increase your uh, um, income for that year, and then you will receive notice saying your income has gone up, and you may actually end up in a higher TSP uh, Medicare part bracket. Very common scenario that happens to a lot of people inadvertently um, is they'll pull out some money from an IRA or a TSP, and that increases their income for that year. And then they end up accidentally pushing themselves into a higher Medicare Part B pricing bracket. So it's something you have to watch with your withdrawals on some of your retirement income. That's a, a great question there. Um, so I'm going to keep moving through here and, and answering some questions. We've got about a few more minutes to answer questions. So let me pull some more out here. Give me one second here, guys, while I... Um, pull some of these additional questions. Bear with me here. We've got a lot of them are very similar to each other, so I think I'm going to try and summarize some of these. Um, when one signs up on the first day, one qualifies to sign up for Medicare. When does the coverage begin? Excellent question. All right. So, uh, when someone signs up on the first day that they're eligible to sign up for Medicare. So you are eligible to sign up three months before you turn 65, the month you are 65, and three months after you turn 65. But the question here is, when does it start, right? So if you, let's say in our example, your, your, medic, your birthday's in May, and it's on May 15th. So on May 15th, you're turning 65. Well, that means in February, you're eligible to sign up for Medicare. Actually, on February 1st, you're eligible to sign up for Medicare. So if you enroll in the month of February, your coverage would take effect the first day of the month you turn 65, not on your 65th birthday, but actually so uh, it would take effect if your birthday was on May 15th and you signed up in February, May 1st, your, your Medicare coverage would take effect. So again, fantastic question there. Um, so I'm going to keep moving. We've got a few more minutes here where we can share some additional questions coming in on the chat. And I do encourage you to ask a chat question if you haven't submitted one. Um, a lot of questions about the secondary and primary here. I think I'm going to 
br- bring that back around again here. Um, when Medicare A and B are primary, can Medicare be secondary? And what are the financial aspects or pros and cons? All right, a very good question. All right. So when Medicare A and B are primary, can Medicare be secondary? So some people say, I want Medicare to be secondary. Well, there's some legal requirements there that Medicare has to be the primary once you become, once you retire and your federal health plan has to be the secondary. And that happens because um, of some legislation written in some of the legal requirements of the law in the Medicare Act. But so basically you cannot select. Some people want to say, oh, I want to pick which one's primary and which one's secondary. But it doesn't work that way. You actually have to pick, um, you have, we have to follow the, um, the, the rules of the Medicare statute and follow, which actually is under the Social Security statute. But you, Medicare will be primary if you're retired, and your federal health plan secondary if you're retired. If you're working, it flips the other way around, and you cannot modify that scenario in any way. Um, those rules will stay based on that. Um, so let's see here. I've got a few more questions here. Um, i got a question about Part D coverage and how it works with um, – uh, Medicare Part D, if you remember, is the prescription drug coverage program. All right, very good question here. Is my drug coverage under the federal health plan credible drug coverage? You remember we touched on that in the in the seminar there. So your medic, your a lot of people are worried about signing up for Part D. Do I need to take it? Is it something I need to buy? So OPM has done some great research on this for you, and they basically have said that all federal health plans have drug coverage that is as good as or better than anything Medicare Part D program has to offer, and therefore it's not recommended that you purchase Part D. However, there is a couple scenarios where sometimes people may benefit from adding D, but you'd have to have a lot of extensive prescriptions, and that is a, a small, very small population. Uh, but generally speaking, for most of your, most federal retirees, you're not going to have to worry about purchasing Medicare Part D. Now, the follow-up question to that is, is there a penalty if I don't purchase Medicare Part D? Well, there is a penalty if you don't have credible drug coverage and wanted to buy Medicare Part D later on. But the great news is all federal health plans have credible drug coverage. Your GHA federal health plans have credible drug coverage, which if they you're covered under a plan that has what's called credible drug coverage, if you want to add Medicare Part D later, you can, and there won't be a penalty. So no worry if, about not signing up for it right away and having a penalty as a federal retiree with your GHA plan because you have drug coverage built into that. And then if you did for some reason want to add it much later on, you can without penalty. So that's a great question on uh, Medicare Part D coverage. And we've just got a couple more minutes left here, so I'm going to run through a few more. Um, ooh, okay, about how do you pay for Medicare, all right? Will Medicare Part B premiums be deducted from my Social Security payment or my pension payment? All right. Can I choose? All right. Very good question. All right. All right. Excellent. So this question here, um, will my Medicare premiums be deducted from my Social Security payment? So the answer is yes. So if you're eligible to receive a Social Security benefit, and there's two types of federal retirees, the people that were covered under the SERS system and the FERS system. So the, some of the SERS people have not paid into Social Security. They um, will still pay their Medicare premiums, though. They can simply select and have that deducted from their federal retirement annuity, or they can sign up for the Medicare Easy Pay program where it would be deducted out of their checking account, or Medicare will send them a bill. If you are eligible to receive Social Security benefits, then it will be deducted from your Social Security benefits. So your Part B premiums will be come out of your – for most of people, most of you are probably a FERS retiree at this point. There's still quite a few SERS retirees out there, but a lot more are FERS right now. Well, probably, if you're a FERS person, you're probably going to have that deducted from your Social Security uh, payments. Since you FERS retirees have paid into the Social Security and the Medicare um, Medicare program. Now, SERS retirees actually, and just as a big thing that a lot of people get confused on, is a lot of people um, or under the SERS retiree system think they haven't paid the Medicare tax and that they might have to buy Medicare Part A. 
which isn't the case. Every federal retiree, whether you're a SERS retiree or a FERS retiree, pays Medicare taxes. And if you've worked 10 years um, and you've been paying Medicare taxes all those years, uh, 40 Social Security quarters, you're eligible to receive Medicare Part A for no cost, and then you'll purchase Part B based on your on the income chart. So great question there on how you pay for Part B. All right, I think we've got time for just uh, one more question here. So I'm going to grab one out here. Um, uh, will I still have the same coverage if I drop from high option to standard option and have Medicare Parts A and B? And the great parts of this is if you have um, the high option and the standard option, as I mentioned earlier, um, your federal health plan coverage will essentially, when Medicare is primary, we waive copays and deductibles on both plans, and you end up with almost 100% coverage on copays on deductibles waived on both plans. The only difference is the prescription drug benefit on name brand prescriptions is a little bit better under the high option. But if you don't have a lot of name brand prescriptions, you're really much better off moving into that standard option and saving a lot on your federal health plan premium. So um, we might not have been able to get to your questions today. We got quite a few questions in. So if you did submit a question on the chat and didn't get a response right away, um, we will follow up with you via your registered email. So I just want to remind everyone that if you didn't get a response on your chat question today or I didn't share your answer through the uh, live questions here, um, we will send you an email with an answer to your chat question. Um, so as to wrap up here, um, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today. And a link with the recorded version of the webcast and a copy of the slides will be sent to the same email address your invitation was sent to by early next week. If you haven't received a response to your submitted question yet, we will respond through your registered email as soon as possible. Thank you again, everyone, for your public service, and have a happy and well-deserved retirement.